So I have this really clear memory of being a child and having this uh, children's Bible. As a Bible, it didn't have like the whole Bible in it. It didn't have Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers in it, but it had all of the major stories of the Bible and each of the stories was illustrated in its own way. And I have this clear memory of the story of Jesus's temptation. There was that picture of Jesus looking kind of defiant standing there and Satan off to the side looking kind of menacing and trying to tempt him. And I had this clear memory as a little kid with this Bible reading the story and looking at this picture and thinking to myself, Satan tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread. Had Jesus done that, why would that have been a sin? Like, how is that a temptation at all? Jesus had just finished uh, fasting and praying for 40 days and 40 nights. Hadn't eaten for over six weeks. If, if he had eaten some bread, that would have been a sin. Or if he had turned the stones into bread. I mean, the first miracle of Jesus' ministry is he changes water into wine. Are you telling me that water into wine is perfectly fine, but stones into bread? Obviously, that's a bridge too far. I mean, where's, where's the sin here? Uh, how, is, how would Jesus have been sinning? How is this a temptation at all? Doesn't the guy deserve some bread? And if he could do it, couldn't he conjure up some bread for himself? So if we look at sin as just moral failings, you know, something that we do that we shouldn't do, or something we should have done that we failed to do, then this passage doesn't make a lot of sense. But perhaps we need to expand what our understanding of sin is. In the last century, one of the greatest spiritual minds uh, was Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was born and baptized in the Episcopal Church, and then he went off and converted and became a Roman Catholic. And he also went off and became a Trappist monk in a monastery called the Abbey of the Gethsemane in Kentucky. And uh, Trappists, or Cistercians, are this uh, severe, austere version of Benedictine monks. Their, their architecture is severe, their daily uh, schedule is severe, and oftentimes they spend most of their day in silence. I guess if you're a monk and you spend most of your time in silence, I guess you have a lot of free time on your hands, I don't know. Uh, but Merton wrote a lot of books, a lot of books, and most of the books that he has written are just like, became instant classics in Western spirituality. And Merton talked a lot about sin. He, um, he had a student by the name of James Finley. Now, Merton has since died, but uh, James Finley is very much alive. Uh, I think he's around 80 now. He just started a podcast. And uh, he had, he was in the Abbey of the Gethsemane, I think for six or seven years with Merton. And Merton was his spiritual director. So while they spent most of their days in silence, every week or so, or every few days, he would go and he would hang out with Merton in Merton's little hut, and James Finley would just drink straight from the source. So here's what James Finley, uh, how he describes Merton's understanding of sin. Finley writes, for Merton, the matter of who we are always precedes what we do. Thus, sin is not essentially an action, but rather an identity. Sin is a fundamental stance of wanting to be what we are not. The spiritual life for Merton moves within the context of an identity given to us by God, distorted and hidden by sin and returned to us by Christ. The spiritual life for Merton is a journey in which we discover ourselves in discovering God and discover God in discovering our true self hidden in God. Now here is Merton uh, 
in his own words. Merton says, All sin starts from the assumption that my false self, the self that exists only in my own egocentric desires, is the fundamental reality of life to which everything else in the universe is ordered. Thus, I use up my life in the desire for pleasure and the thirst for experiences, for power, honor, knowledge. I know that's kind of thick and heavy, but what Finley and Merton are saying is that God creates us to be a certain kind of person. And I don't mean like he creates us like as this like group of nameless, faceless people. I mean like he creates Rick, me, to be a certain kind of person. He creates you to be a certain kind of person. To use different language, he has a dream for your life. And the spiritual life is about figuring out who that is. Who am I? Who am I meant to be? And then walking that path. And then when I step off that path from who I am in God, who I'm meant to be, that is sin. Now, sometimes that can be moral failing. Right? Like, uh, you know, God does not create anyone to be a murderer. Right? And so if any of us, you know, murder someone or, you know, become a thief or, um, you know, a liar or any of like things that are just clear moral precepts, those are things that all of us do that would step us off of our path. But then there's the other stuff that's not particularly moral at all, but it's just not meant to be us. I mean, I could, if I wanted to, pursue a career as a professional wrestler. You know, I can get the, the crazy outfit and like the big mustache that goes down here and, and I could get a wild name and I could learn how to jump off the top ropes and give someone a pile driver or whatever it's called. I, mean, I could do that. And that would not be immoral at all. I mean, I, you can, I guess, be a godly professional wrestler, but I'm pretty clear that that isn't what God wants me to do. And so to pursue that would be to step off my path. I could decide I'm gonna be a, a mathematician. Now, I'm terrible at math, like really. Um, terrible at math. In fact, my constant joke is I went to seminary because there's no math. You know, there's 10 commandments, there's 12, 12 disciples, that's it. I'm like, seminary is for me. Um, but I could, I could pursue a career in mathematics, however terrible I am. That wouldn't be immoral, but I'm very clear that that's not who I'm meant to be. God has uh, something that God wants me to be a kind of person, um, a kind of Christian. And when I walk that path, when I'm seeking that, then I'm where I need to be. And the times that, you know, I fall off that path, that's, it's usually me trying to like, you know, shoehorn something in that isn't meant to be there. That's usually me trying to be something that I know I'm not supposed to be. And so then I come back onto the path. And therefore, sin is less about the things we do or the things we fail to do and more about who I am and what I'm called to be. And therefore, the spiritual life is about finding that path and sticking to it, which means that the spiritual life is just life. There is no, okay, now I'm going to be a spiritual person. I'm, it's, it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and I'm going to go to church and then I'm going to come home and I'm going to go to work and I'm going to live the rest of my life. No, the journey of life, the spiritual life, is life. Who am I? What am I meant to do? It's, an, it's a spiritual question, but it's not just a spiritual question. It's the journey of life. And so if we look at sin in this way, then Jesus' temptation to turn 
uh, stones into bread. Well, let's think about that for a minute. It wouldn't have been a moral failing for him to eat bread after fasting for 40 days. It's, if he can turn water into wine, then turning stones into bread shouldn't be a problem. But if, you, if he did fall into that temptation, if he did succumb, and he, and he performed that miracle, he turned those stones into bread, it would be the only miracle in his entire ministry that was for him. Every other miracle that Jesus performs in the Gospels are for other people. He changes water into wine for other people. He heals the blind for them. He heals the deaf for them. He heals the, heals the paralyzed for them. He stills a storm. He calms a storm because of the people on the boat who are in the midst of the sea and who are scared to death. Every miracle he performs is for other people. If he changed stones into bread for himself, what if the plan that God had for Jesus was that he was meant to live his life for others? What if he was meant to use his power for others? And he was, meant to, he was meant to live for other people. He was meant to die for other people. And so making stones into bread, while not immoral, would have been Jesus stepping off the path that God had for him. Who are you? It's a big question, but it's also, it's kind of exhilarating. I mean, when I get around with my, uh, my colleagues and we say, what are you preaching about this weekend? And we say, well, preaching about sin. Everyone goes, oh no, it's like, oh, like it's this dour, terrible conversation. But if sin isn't just about uh, what I've done, but it's about exploring who I'm meant to be that's not a dour, terrible conversation. That's something that's exciting. And it's something that never ends. Like you never like, figured it out, I've done it. No, it's a lifelong pursuit. Like it's a, it's a pursuit that's beyond Sunday school. It's beyond confirmation. It doesn't matter if you're 110 years old, there is still more that you are meant to be. Even if there's nothing more for you to do, there's more for you to be. And so figuring out who we are and walking that path that God has given us, this, this is the way.